uh, trip act anyway. So, Aye, but Barry, thank you so much for uh, coming on the podcast. It's uh, you're one of those names that's been on my list to to bring on for a while. So we're finally. Agreed on a date and a time. We finally got round to it. Yeah. So uh, I that's do appreciate you taking the time out of your day because you are a busy man. I think you're possibly busier than myself, <laughs> judging by your Facebook, which is... Uh, it is, yeah. And uh, it is funny because I've spoke to quite a few different people now. When I went on, we're obviously friends on Facebook, but we've never... Yeah. I, I don't think we've crossed paths before. I think I met you. Um, I'm sure I, I, um, I might have been at King Cons. I'm sure I, I came in and seen you play at King Cons or something. But yeah, we haven't we haven't like formally actually shook hands and met. I don't think yet. Because we've got, I had a wee look. We've got 29 mutual friends. Uh huh. And it was similar to Martin Malady when he came. Yeah. And I said to Martin, you know, Martin, I know all about you, but we've just never crossed that. <laughs> and we've yeah. got. We play all the same places, all the same gigs. We've got all the same music sort of friends. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was just one of those things where our paths have never crossed. I kind of feel that's the same as yourself. It was yeah. with a, a wee bit with Barry Frame and, mm -hmm. and a few others that have came on that, you know, we all know who each other is because yeah. we all kind of go in the same circles, but we just never seem to cross paths. But, yeah. it is, but it's good to have you on, finally actually get a, a good blether. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. Thanks so much for um, for having me on, Ryan. That's fine. But what I do is um, we're going to talk about all things music, mm -hmm. things about yourself, growing up, what inspired yeah. you, your thoughts on songwriting, on gigging, mm -hmm. everything in between. But what we always do is we go right back to the very beginning. So mm -hmm. where were you brought up and where are you into music from a very young age? Yes, yeah, so I was I was born in Stirling. I was born in Cornton uh, in Stirling, uh, which is actually not too far from where I live currently. Although I've travelled a wee bit since and came back. And um, my earliest memory is really music. Uh, none, nobody in my family is particularly musical. There's nobody that played an instrument really, um, like in terms of aunties and uncles and you know mum and dad and stuff. But um, my dad was a big uh, a big fan of uh, Queen. And uh, and it used to him and my mum used to drink in, in the local pub and uh, uh, my sort of first real awareness in music and records and you know that whole kind of tangible thing of getting something and putting it onto a device and then listening to it was I'm trying to think what age I'd have been as well maybe seven or eight it must have been and it was when the jukebox in the local pub the chalet as it was called when they changed the records. The, the owner gave my dad the old records. Right. He used to obviously switch them out every so many weeks or whatever, you know. Um, right. And I'll always remember, like, um, so they were all like, wee singles, basically, you know. Right. But um, because they'd been on the jukebox, they had the middle section had been popped out. So you needed this kind of adapter thing to be able to play it on a normal record player. So uh, I just remember all of these sorts of records uh, listening to... Yeah, you know, Madonna, Like a Virgin was a, was a tune because that, that, that kicked off a wee bit of a funny debate because I'd asked my mum and dad what a virgin was <laughs> uh, but on the back of that, that record. Um, was, and that, I just remember, was that when your dad said, ask your mum? That was exactly what he said. And then I went and asked my mum and she said, go and ask your dad. I said, he's just told me to ask you. Uh, and my dad said, uh, all I'll say, son, is it's something that's never been touched. Uh, and he left it at that. So... Um, so yeah, there was all, uh, and you can uh, you can imagine at that stage. I was born in seventy eight, so that must have been mid eighties, you know, eighty four, eighty five ish. Um, but I, I remember, I remember Queen being a big thing, uh, being a really big band for like my dad certainly, and then my uncle George, who was another guy who was, um, used to play his music really loud, and he stayed quite near me, and I could hear it from my flat. He was right into Phil Collins and you know Genesis and that type of stuff and Bowie. It's just. It's pure 70s and 80s. Aye, aye. Aye. But, um, so obviously, there's nobody in your family that plays a musical instrument, like your mum or dad or that. Yeah. Similar, similar to myself, my mum and dad, mm -hmm. they didn't play uh, any instrument. My dad, m b both parents, but especially my dad, was really into mm -hmm. music, and it was stuff he grew up on, stones, yeah. and all that sort of thing. So that's probably where I kind of got my musical sort of 
and inf- early influence from. Yeah. But um, what age were you then when you? You know, there's there's always a point where you all of a sudden mm-hmm. develop your own musical taste. Mm-hmm. A lot of people, it seems to be around the age of ten, eleven, maybe when you're mm-hmm. going to school. Um, what age were you when you developed your own musical taste, and who were some of the bands that you were starting to discover for yourself? A uh, really good question. So, so I was probably a slightly later starter, um, and that was largely because of uh, personal circumstances. So, I lived I lived in Stirling. I went to Wallace High for first year. I don't remember like any of my mates at Wallace. We were more into sort of football and stuff like that. There wasn't really there wasn't really any musos in in that in that um, peer group, and I didn't really hang about with anybody. Uh, like at the music block or anything like that. The, the one thing I will say is I've, I've always been able to sing. Like w- w- some of my earliest um, performance memories or, or kind of music memories would be my mum getting me to sing. You know, people would be back at the house. You know, probably had a few beers or wines or whatever, and my mum would be like, "Go and sing that." So I used to sing um, "Walking in the Air" by Alan Jones because I had quite a full saddle voice before it broke, and. Uh, and I used to sing in choirs, like the BB choir and stuff like that. So I've always had that ability to sing, which is which, which is quite cool. And I found that at a young age. But in terms of developing my own musical taste, that that probably came when I moved to Denny High because I went to Denny High at the start of second year, mm-hmm. and because I didn't really know anybody, Ian, it was that way where um, the, the the guys I ended up hanging about with actually really just by a pure stroke of luck. The uh, guy called Craig Taylor, who was one of my good pals at school, um, and uh, and he was a guitarist, and I didn't know any guitarist, so he just happened to be the first person that I really befriended yeah. uh, at, at Denny, because he used to walk past my house to to go to school, so I ended up walking with him, and and uh, and then we ended up um, forming a wee band together. So it was it was I, 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 I don't know if I've ever told them this, but you'll see it now that it's obviously in the in the public domain when this goes live. Uh, I've got him to thank for a lot because it's he was that guy that came along with uh, uh, Nirvana and Pearl Jam cassettes yeah. and said, listen to these guys, you know. Um, and I'm no sure, if I look at my peer group in Stirling, that I'd have got exposed to that mm-hmm. with them. It would have been probably dance music, you know, which was, which was breaking through at that point, or the rave scene and stuff. Um, or maybe, you know, Britpop or Basis, that type of thing. But because um, Craig and the guys, John and Barry and, and uh, Brian, who was, who was the rest of the band that we had at high school, we were all into that Seattle scene, and MTV was, was the big thing. Yeah, yeah, I think 1993, 94, 92, 93, 94, when that was all... That's my, right, that was that one, though. You would have been probably about 14, 15. That's right, yeah, 13, 14, 15, that, that he, would. He's soaking it all in. And yeah, inspired by it. What was the band called? So we, the, the, it was like a covers band we had, and we used to play um, Pearl Jam, Nirvana, Soundgarden, Rage Against the Machine, which was yeah. quite fun to play. And we called ourselves Breed, B R E E D, which was after a. I'm sure that was a Nirvana tune. Actually, we lifted it for that. Uh, and I used to wear these silly sort of funky hats, and I was like quite wee, and the rest of the guys were all quite tall. Um, but it was uh, looking back, I that was a great because like, we didn't have things like ultimate guitar tabs or backing tracks or you know what I mean. Anything like that. That's such an indulgence now. That the, the I'm going to say that 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 phrase that always makes my hair stand on end. The young people didn't know how good they've got it these days, right? Because we would for us to play a song in the band, we would literally need to sit down and listen with a cassette and stop and go. We think that's an A. Right, that might be a that might be a B. That's a C. You know what I mean? So you literally need to kind of work it out. This is um, funny. I can actually remember. I, I'm I was Denny High as well. That's why I was asked right. uh, the name. But I, I'm a, I think I'm about three years younger than you. Right. Okay. But it does kind of ring a bell a wee bit. Uh, mm-hmm. But I can remember doing the same thing. So I, can, mm-hmm. or, you know, if you went and got a back then it was cassette tapes, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, if you had you. Get the wee sort of booklet thing that would fold out. Yeah. And a lot of them had the, the lyrics and bits. That's and, right, so it helped out. Yeah. But sometimes they didn't. And I can remember starting a covers band and we didn't have the, it didn't have the lyrics. And, you, mm-hmm. you know, the internet didn't exist. You couldn't go online. <laughs> right? And I can remember 
the, th- the three of us in the band all going home to our separate houses, mm-hmm. meeting up the next day. And the task for the previous evening was, right, sit and listen to the song and we'll all write down what we think the words are. Yeah, that's right, yeah. We'll compare notes and it'd be like, right, the three of us have wrote the same for the first three lines, right? We've all wrote something different for the fourth line, so what do we think it is? What is it, I? Trying to figure it out that way, and then I just say, trying to figure out the chords and try to learn a wee bit. I remember um, speaking to Barry Frame, mm-hmm. right? And kind of similar that it's brilliant today if, if, you're, if you're young wanting to learn, mm-hmm. get yourself onto YouTube. I want yeah. a song, there's a million people giving you free lessons online. Mm-hmm. Play it. But back when we were younger, you had to sit and actually figure it out. <laughs> and I, I'd say to Barry, if you were really lucky, mm-hmm. if there was a local music shop when they still existed, you, you might be able to get um, sheet music. And if you were really lucky, it'd have, right. it would have the tablature down the bottom because That's right. most people didn't read it. I can remember Barry saying that, um, remember Music City up in Falkirk High Street? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there was the upstairs bit where all the keyboards and everything were, and there was the sheet music. And he he says he got chucked out of the shop because he, he'd asked for a bit of A4 paper and a, a paper. <laughs> he, he could copy out books, the, the guitar solo for a song, because he, he couldn't figure it out. Aye. And, and, and the thing is, and, those books were like 20 odd quid or something. They, yeah. they, they were really expensive to buy them, obviously. Eh? So yeah. I've still got a few. I've got, I'm sure I've got, a, I've got a Paul Weller one, I've got a Turing Breaks one. I think I've got David Gray White Ladder, like that somewhere, like either in the studio or in the loft or something, because obviously you don't really need them now. But I've got I've got the remnants of some of those books. I. So would you say you're probably your 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 big kind of discovery music, but probably like the kind of grunge era? It, it was definitely the grunge, and it was definitely um, circumstantial because it was me moving through to Denny. Mm-hmm. Kind of getting in tow with the group of lads that I did. I'm very grateful for that, actually, when I look back. I, I really enjoyed my time in Denny. Denny was a very different place to Stirling. Um, you know, it's eight miles as the crow flies, but, but culturally quite different. And um, as I say, I, I didn't know anybody where I was from in the corner that played a guitar. But there was loads of folk in Denny that played uh, a guitar. So I was like a week in a hotbed of creativity. And I don't know if it's like... Community, I've tried to think about that, you know, like, obviously Glasgow has always been quite a big sort of creative music city, and Denny's got a wee bit of overspill for Glasgow families and stuff, so I don't know if that's what it is, or maybe the, there's the Irish connection to it, I don't know. Uh, you've got to remember, I suppose, with Denny, or Denny High School, is that it wasn't just Denny, you've got mm-hmm. Bonnie Bridge, Bank. That's right, Bank Rock and all that as well, oh, right. in the area. So You've got a big catchment of people going to this school, yeah. And I think part of it is also, you know, if you'd went to Denny High and you were there in 2010, it'd be mm-hmm. very different from what it was like back in 19. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there was obviously, there was something quite, like, like magical about music, sort of in, the, I, I think, it was it was 90s. 70s, 80s, and 90s. Mm-hmm. And, I don't I always kind of think, I mean, it still continues and you find amazing bands up to this very day, but maybe it's partly because that was your youth when you were brought up, but there was something great about being a teenager in the 90s if you were using yeah. it. I think what we had in the 90s, we were the, I think we were probably the last generation of that, really. If, I was speaking to someone about this the other day. Like, at the minute... Music is so diverse and there's so many different niches and, you know, you can literally go and find some really obscure niche on an internet and that could be your thing, you know, like some Japanese indie rock uh, uh, niche. But when we were growing up, I think there was there was sort of movement still. So there was, you know, like there had been in the 70s with punk and stuff as well and then you had the Seattle scene, then you had Britpop and at the same time you had the sort of Manchester rave scene mm-hmm. and you, you, I was quite lucky like I didn't I, I, I felt I, I could appreciate the three of those genres you know the three of those movements so I didn't really pigeonhole myself into I, when I was at school I was very grungy I had the kind of the, the complete outfit of the, of the grunge geek I had the middle part and greasy hair I had the tartan <laughs> shirt <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was like the kind of that was like the uniform for the Denny High Music Aye, Department. Thank you. Make it even worse. 
if you can imagine a centre party that you can yeah. put, be t- put behind your ears. That was it. That was the move. But had it shaved like this underneath. Aye, an undercut. That's it right. Horrendous looking, but you thought you were the, the cool as anything back then. We, we, we were kind of cool. And, and actually, it, it stood the test of time to the extent that that's came round again. You, you know, I mean, like that whole kind of grunge scene is now... Uh, fashion is revolutionary anyway, but it's it's come back in there, hasn't it? But we're it's very lucky. It's when you're talking about music, because mm-hmm. I've asked this question before, and some people agree, some people disagree, but you're talking about how how music, we, we were like the last sort of generation of sorts. But what, what I could try and say is, you know, rock and roll was born in the 50s, right? Mm-hmm. And then the 60s, you had all these amazing bands, the Beatles, yeah. the Stones, the Doors, the Who, all kind of coming out, a lot of drug stuff. You know, mm-hmm. they were creating stuff that had never been heard before. Yeah. Different sounds and everything. Yeah. 70s, you had obviously disco, you had punk, you had mm-hmm. Tin Nation. I mean, again, it still had its di- a different, its own little style, different mm-hmm. anything that had been done before. The 80s, no doubt, had its own. You yeah. know, whether you liked it or not and yeah. then, when the 90s came around some people would say ah, it had already been done by the 90s but I would disagree and say the 90s still had its own sound because you had mm-hmm. you had obviously your your, your Brit uh, especially in the UK Brit pop mm-hmm. there's no mm-hmm. whether you liked it or not it ruled the air mm-hmm. was a, yeah. massive and it was a movement for a few years yeah it had grunge which was everywhere you know, if you were listening to your heavy metal mm-hmm. the 90s compared to the mid 90s, you know, with the change of new metal and all that, mm-hmm. the, a change. I personally feel that when, see when by the time 2000 hit, mm-hmm. between 2000 and now, there is countless, there is so many great bands out there creating mm-hmm. music, but I've not heard anything that I've not heard previously. There's, mm-hmm. there's not heard anything that I go, that's a new sound that I've never heard before. Yeah. I go, that's great, but it sounds like... But they've lifted it for something else, yeah. And and I suppose, I don't know if that's just a timing thing, because I don't know, I've heard kind of maybe the generation slightly ahead of us bemoan the fact that Oasis are just the Beatles. You know what I mean? Like They, they just see Oasis and go, whereas when I look at Oasis, whilst of course you can totally recognise the nod to their... Um, their references, right? And they don't even, they, you know, the, the guys didn't even hide it. But there was something still quite fresh about their sound. Do you know what I mean? I was just watching uh, Supersonic again last night, actually, um, and it, it struck me that, and I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was a massive Oasis fan. I appreciated what they did, and I liked their tunes, and I play a lot of them, and I do covers because they're very popular. But um, I have a lot of respect for them. You, you, you know, and of course you have to because of the success that the guys had. The, the different thing with them, I mean, there's no denying, I mean, they would be the first people to tell you heavily influenced by the Beatles. Yeah. But the Beatles didn't have the attitude that they had. N- no, and I think that's what can put some people off. But um, um, but it's, it depends on what you want to see. I mean, if you look at it, um, and it depends on what you want from your quote-unquote rock stars, right? So you've got Chris Martin, Nicole Play, vegan, drinks green tea, you know, um, quite sanitised, probably a lovely fellow, I don't know the guy, right? But um, I'm not sure I was sitting want to listen to a Coldplay record, but I'd go and see them live, because they're, they're really, visually, and their music, it lends itself to big arenas, and, you know, everybody gets involved. Oasis, and you can't imagine, like, you know, Chris Martin throwing a telly out of a hotel room, for example, it just wouldn't be his thing. Whereas Oasis, they sort of, I suppose, felt like they had to create that, you know, for them, or certainly for Liam, maybe not for Noel, for Liam, that was part of that package. That was what a rock star meant to them. So it was almost as if they were playing up to it, weren't they? But I think that, well, personally, I'd, I'm not I'm not a big Oasis fan, but I thought that was just brilliant. See, mm-hmm. see sitting in interviews, we're the best band in the world, and they probably yeah. did it themselves, and having this attitude, you know, that's maybe what's missing from a lot of music nowadays, is that, that it's a bit boring. Very sanitised, doesn't that? Yeah, I don't think that's just foot, um, uh, just um, music. I think it's in football as well. You look at the characters they used to get back in the seventies and eighties yeah. on the pitch and off the pitch. 
you wouldn't get away with that in a professional club now with some of the behaviours that, that we used to see as characters, you know. And I think it's the same with the rock stars. You wouldn't get like a Motley Crue, for example. You imagine if a band like them came out now with social media and the culture that exists, I don't think they would get very far. Probably be all locked up in prison. <laughs> <laughs> Very good chat. I'm surprised about the crew, aren't they, actually? But I, uh... but Barry, um, so you're obviously get, getting influenced. When you're playing in this band, at high mm-hmm. school, are you just singing or uh, did you pick the guitar up at some point? So um, I, I'd, I only ever wanted to be a singer. I had, I had no real... Um, I had no real inclination to be because like Eddie Vedder was my hero, like and 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 there, and I know he played the guitar and stuff and wrote with the guitar, but early Pearl Jam, he was just the front man. He was just singing, you know. So you had the guys like you know Jim Morrison, Eddie Vedder, that sort of stock in sort of you know engaging front man was enigmatic. That that was what I saw really as the um, as the archetype that that I would want to try and uh, develop. Um, but I also realised that there was a creativity in me. Um, well, whilst we were in a covers band, one of the first things I learned on the guitar, played on the guitar, was a tune I wrote myself. So right from the get-go, very, very simple. could probably still remember it just about, but um, it wasn't even a proper chord. It was like I was playing with two fingers and making a chord, yeah. a sound, and messing about. And, and But that was like one of the first things I actually played on the guitar was, was a tune that I wrote myself. So... That that was pointing to me that that there was a creativity that I needed some sort of instrument ability, and then d- d- because I was in the the band, the covers band uh, at school, um, we were all at the music block together. So when I was doing my standard grade um, music, we had to choose two instruments. You couldn't you couldn't just sing it, wasn't it? So it was guitar and I think I did drums, although. I'll admit I'm, I'm not much of a drummer, um, to be honest. So, but I, I fumbled my way through that, the standard grade for that. But um, but it was good. It was good to learn, and I'm so glad I learned it then too, because this is a, this is a conversation I have with my teenage laddie at the moment. Um, you'll never ever ever regret the time you spent learning an instrument when you're a teenager. But I'll tell you what, you will regret no spending as not as much time as you should have. You know what I mean? Like one of the things I look back on is. I wished during that window somebody had pushed me a wee bit to say, just put in a few more hours, learn your craft, um, because it will pay dividends downstream, you know. How, how did you learn the guitar? Was it just self-taught or did you go to learn? Pretty much self-taught. My dad took me along to a guy in Denny, I can't, can't remember the gentleman's name, um, uh, uh, but I was a typical teenager, Ian. Like, I, I thought I knew everything. Even though I couldn't play the guitar, I was trying to tell this guy that that's no an A. Like, I, I remember the song, we were trying to learn... Um, uh, I think it was Roadhouse Blues or something, and the uh, guy says, it starts in A, and I'm like, no, it doesn't it? He's like, it does, it starts in A. <laughs> and I've never played the guitar before, but in my ear, it didn't sound like an A, so um, I don't think I'm particularly easy to teach, especially as a teenager. Um, so I, I just, yeah, I just fumbled my way through it, you know, like, listening to t- watching the guys in Breed. Uh, we were really lucky, because, like, Craig in particular... Um, and John Shaw, who's uh, who was the bassist in the band, and Barry Pitt, who's now a sound engineer and travels all over the world, um, and still in the industry. And John's still in the industry. And Craig, I'm sure, still has the capability, but he's um, he does other things outside of music now. But um, really lucky that that there was accomplished musicians around me. So by osmosis, I picked a lot of it up. But still to this day, and even though I would probably put myself at uh, um, intermediate level guitar, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I still didn't see myself as a guitarist. I look at other proper guitarists and go, they're proper guitarists. And I'm just a singer that plays the guitar, really, you know? Yeah, I'm probably the other way around. Mm-hmm. I've I, I played guitar for years, but I've only got into, used to do, always do backing singing, and, and I've done yeah. the recording in the privacy of my own wee man cave. Yeah. Never was a, a front person singer. I only took that up after lockdown. Right. All right, okay, all oh, cool. So it was that thing where I, I was, you know, you've seen me obviously in the pubs. Aye. And, uh, and, and I'll go out and I'll play for three hours, no bother. Yeah. Still don't see myself as a singer. I see myself as Aye. a who does singing because you need someone to sing. Yeah, yeah. But that, that's that's made, funny, that, eh? It's a confidence thing, but see with the uh, singing, did you get mm-hmm. like that or, did, or was it just from when you were young just doing it? I've just, I've been really lucky with that, I think. Um I've just always had an innate ability to sing. So I've always had, uh, I remember when I went to Denny High and the, the 
and I didn't, I didn't know anything about pitch or, you know what I mean, like nothing like that. I just knew that if I heard something, I can sing it, and I can sing it in tune, and uh, and and I knew that folk used to make a fuss. I used to sing at karaoke and that when I was younger, and I'd go into like the local pubs and whatever with mum and dad, and if there was a karaoke, and go, go and sing that song, and. Yeah. Of course, you'd sing it, and, and I may have not been that great, but because I was young, people obviously are quite fond and and um, and I, I sang, I, got, I sang for a choir, Central Scotland. My memory's a wee bit fuzzy, but Central Scotland Schools Choir picked me up, and I don't actually quite know how I got into that. I think it was through the BBs because I used to sing in the BB choir. Ended up in Central Scotland Schools Choir, and I got picked to do a solo at a big show that they did at the Falkirk Town Hall. It could only be in about ten or eleven, so there was like I don't know, sixty, seventy odd kids. Mm-hmm. And I was doing a solo, so there must have been some sort of ability there to uh, to sing and hold a note. But when I went to um, to Denny High, the, um, the 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 music teacher, um, I'm sure it was Shirley Ricky actually, and I'll tell you a funny story about Shirley in a minute actually, yeah. a nice story. But um, um, I'm sure it was Shirley, uh, Mrs. Ricky. Um, she had said, do you know, such and such a song. I don't know what the song was, and anyway, I just started singing it, right? And I never really thought m- much of it. Must have been a contemporary song. I just started singing it. And she sits down at the piano and she starts playing. She went, oh, you were 100% in key there. You, you, you sang it without, without prompt and without guide. You sang it in the exact right note. She, she said, that's really cool. Did you know you did that? I said, I, I didn't. So when you said the song, something triggered in my brain. I started singing it. And it was pretty much exactly as it is on the record. So there's, there's obviously some sort of innate ability there, I would say. It's funny that you say, um, I know the teacher that you're talking about. Oh, did you know Mrs. Rika, yeah? Yeah. Mrs. Rika, it might have been. And, um, but she obviously took an interest, encouraged you. Yeah. But, and, um, you know, I had a music t- teacher. It wasn't Mrs. Rika, though. It was um, Linda Muir, Miss Muir. Right. Mm-hmm. She, st- she, she started... She, you would have maybe probably have left because I think she started when I was in fifth year. Right, I had to go on. I think that point. the older guy that was the sort of department. That's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, What's his name again? I can't remember his name. I, I, I was never in his class. He's a nice fellow though, I remember that. It was pretty cool. But um, she, re- she replaced him and, and she yeah. obviously, you, you think back now, she clearly obviously seen that I had a, a, a real interest in the guitar. Mm-hmm. So, she encouraged it, but the problem I had is I just wanted to, I just wanted to rock. I just wanted to, yeah. I, was, I was interested in learning what does this word mean for a quiet, uh, for a, a no. rock and all that sort of stuff and um, sitting listening to bits of classical music. But I can remember actually what, I think it was fifth year or fourth or fifth year. I think I was in Mrs. Ricky's class and mm-hmm. the task was that we all had to write a song. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the problem I had is that I, I was keep more. I'd been playing bands for a, a band for about four years. Mm-hmm. For this point, so I was more than capable. But at that age, I had zero confidence. You mm-hmm. know, not a chance I would have sang in front of anybody. Just not a chance. Yeah. I plucked up the courage to obviously write down the words and the chords and all that, and uh, brought it in. And she didn't believe that I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that's a good side then, isn't that? Right. Totally, like knocked my confidence because she. Was, oh right, okay. Oh, you need to sing it so I can hear it. I was like, I- I'm not singing it. I'm not doing it. But obviously, <laughs> it was just the age you were. But it's amazing that that yourself at that age mm-hmm. were the complete opposite. You obviously just had this confidence because a lot of singers, Aye. a lot of singers. First of all, there's a lot of people they don't want to be a singer. It's mm-hmm. whoever's whoever is the most brave. To step in front of the microphone because the band needs a singer. Yeah. And um, there's a lot of people that they're not comfortable doing it, but you're the opposite. You you wanted to be a singer more than anything else. Mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, I, I did, and, and because I knew I could do it. So, so I knew I could sing, whereas I didn't feel confident being able to play the guitar or learn the guitar to a level. Even when I started playing the guitar and like Bullet for Pablo and stuff, I always felt that was the weaker part of my game. But um, despite having the desire to do it and that was what I wanted to be was like the Eddie Vedder or the um, uh, you know the Jim Morrison types or Bob Dylan to a lesser extent um, I still had really bad stage fright and, and actually until I started gigging regularly as in a bit like you post-Covid because I, I just went out in the circuit really 
I, I've barely picked up the guitar for 12 years when I was growing up and, and doing all the corporate roles I was doing and traveling and having kids and stuff. So I barely looked at the guitar. And it was only really because of lockdown that I was able to pick the guitar back up in, in earnest and then did a couple of things on Facebook and then got invited to go and play um, at Oscars very kindly by Nicky, who trusted in me to go and, and do a wee slot, even though I said I'm, I've, I've not got like three hours worth of material, but give me a few months and I'll, I'll work on it type thing in. <laughs> and she gave me, she was great, and she gave me a, she gave me a, well, she trusted me and gave me the leg up, um, uh, and then, and then my confidence just built for there. But I had really bad, stage fright like it never used to come across and people was always be like nah no way but it was sometimes I was sick before gigs and stuff like physically sick because I was so nervous it's funny I've, I've heard other people say that like I, I think it was maybe Ian Whitfield mm-hmm. that had said no, this was obviously back when he, he was yeah. I, th- I think it was Whitty that had said that he th- got his first gig booked and he was that nervous that he he was sick in the car park or something, and yeah. he phoned them up and says, "I can't, I can't, I can't." Yeah. And uh, and obviously you see him now. He's, he's you know he's he's doing however many gigs every week, and yeah. you know he's obviously came on from it. But I, I was probably a wee bit different because I gigged for years with Liam. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and prior to gigging with Liam, I played in at least three or four different bands. Right. So I was always that thing where I was used to playing with other people or a company. Mm-hmm. Oh, wasn't it? Yeah. Even when even when I'm doing the the pub gigs with Liam, the spotlight was on Liam, right? So Aye. so I, I'm playing lead guitar and doing backing vocals. Mm-hmm. If I mess up, you know, as long as Liam keeps going, nobody Aye. notices. If Liam messes up, you know that's all. Yeah. Right. Uh, so you kind of build your confidence from that. So when I, when lockdown came around and I was like the whole thing shut down. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I'm just going to switch over and do rhythm and vocals because I, I know I can do it. Mm-hmm. I'm not any better. I'm not any worse than anybody. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and that was fine. And that was the, the weird. That was the weird one. Is everybody I speak to when they first start out, they also say that um, you know you've got to play for three hours. It's usually nine till twelve at night that you play. Aye, yeah, yeah. Three hours is a long, long time. It is. Aye, aye. Other songs. And uh, a lot of people, when they first started out, it's the same old story. They only had an hour and a half worth of yeah. songs. They played yeah. those, I don't know, say that, 20 songs. They play those 20 songs, and then they just basically play them again. Play them again, yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Whereas, and uh, sometimes you can get away with that, because the audience can change as well. No, I mean, well, it's not always the same. People get drunk as well, but uh. I think that was one of the unique ones, that because I've been playing the pubs for so long, I did actually have three hours or right. more worth of, of material. The problem I had is that I was sick and tired of playing the songs before I did yeah. my first ever gig. Yeah. But do you do you still you still do the covers cover gigs? Hi, so that I mean that that's been the biggest um so um I suppose you could look as with everybody's life, you could look at my musical journey in chapters. So you had uh the first real chapter by any Meeting the Bones was Denny High, right? And and that was kind of being in the band, doing the covers, being the lead singer, um, no playing any instruments in that band, although learning the guitar in the background. And then we left high school, and <clears throat> I didn't really do much for a few years. Yeah, I still love music and would go to loads of gigs and stuff like that, but never really picked up the guitar uh, to any great extent. And then in my mid-20s, that was the second main chapter was a band called Bullet for Pablo. We had a few kind of n- names early yeah. on in, in, in the period, but Bullet for Pablo was who we became and what we became known for. Um, and that was an original materials band, and I played the guitar in that, so I played rhythm um, and sang. Um, and then then there was what I called the grown-up phase, so that was the, the, the day job, the corporate roles, the kids, you know, the, all that sort of stuff, and, and there was very little room for the guitar. I was working away a lot, I was travelling around Europe, so I was away usually during the week and I'd get home at the weekends and any time and energy I had had to be given over to the kids, so the guitar and, 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 and any notions of that took the back seat. I would still play occasionally because friends would ask me to go and play a wedding or something like that and um, and that was really the... So I, I remember a couple of weddings that I played at my friend Neil, um, Katie's um, cousin's Cara's wedding as well, and I played two or three covers um, that they had selected. So a song up the aisle, 
by the way, like wedding gigs were really, really nerve wracking because especially like, you know, you just didn't want to make a mistake, you know, and you're playing somebody's special day like that. But um, playing a song up dial, a song when they're signing the register and a song, it doesn't sound like that much. But for me, it was massive because I hadn't really done much. And I practiced for like weeks beforehand um, just for these three or four tunes. I don't um, I don't. I don't do wedding gigs. I've, I've done a few you know. in the past, and people have asked me, but I just I don't do it because for the amount of stress, it's just yeah. that um, it can it can be. There's well, a different level. You know, you're charging better money in that, but mm-hmm. the amount of stress involved, I think I'll just I'll just stick to the pubs. I think. <laughs> I and it is, it's horses for courses, isn't it? And it's um, and it's whatever you get because it's one thing to be like an entertainer and a performer or a musician or whatever you want to call yourself, but 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 you you are still it's you up there, you, you know what I mean? So if it's not something you enjoy doing, you, you know, there's no point in doing it, really, is there? You know, so um, uh, I take your point. Like it's no, uh, uh, there's no point in adding any extra pressure to yourself if you don't enjoy it. But um, uh, so uh, so the wedding stuff and the and the current um. Cover stuff really just came out of that lockdown period, yep. um, picking up the guitar, having played a few w- weddings for friends and family and, and getting nice feedback and people saying, oh, could you play our wedding? I said, no, I don't really do this. It was just a kind of one-off thing. Um, and then Katie, who's, you know, largely always been my biggest fan, bless her, uh, um, and um, saying, you know, you need to try and get out. You need, and I'm like, I will do, I will do, you know, uh, waiting for the right opportunity. And then, of course, covid Sort of was the right opportunity, bad circumstances, but right opportunity because nobody was going anywhere. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't travelling for work. Um, I was sitting in the office. I had guitars ra- around me every day. So, I, I, you know, I was picking the guitar up more and more. And then I, I got asked to do a, a charity thing for um, Strathcarron Hospice by Ian Donald, which I did a wee half hour. I was really nervous about that as well. Um, and you know, sitting in my studio where Facebook Live and like genuinely felt nauseous, but um, it, it went reasonably well. And then, yeah, and then just went out and did a, an open mic night for a friend of mine, Chrissy Wilson, who'd um, asked me to go along and play. And then on the back of that, it's just developed. So the cover stuff, um, I am glad I've got back into it. No, I know, like, it's, um, I'm booked right through to, I was looking at my diary, because like, somebody had asked if I could do a gig, and I just realised, and it was by total accident, I've no, I've no actively sought um, events. Um, I'm booked right through to, like, July, Fridays and Saturdays, and, yeah. and, 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 and Sundays, which is brilliant, you know, so, um, so, yeah, I'm very grateful. It can be tiring, as you'll know, it can be, if you've got a day job, and kids, and, you know, whatever else, sometimes you get to that weekend, and you just want to chill, yeah. But, you know, you're gigging on the Friday, you've got two gigs on the Saturday and gigging on the Sunday, and sometimes it can seem like there's another mountain to climb. But once you get there, you get the adrenaline and the rush and the buzz, it, it kind of dissipates somewhat. Eh? Do you like doing, doing the cover gigs? Because I've got a bit of a love-hate relationship with them. Um, but, I mean, sometimes you'll go, do, you'll go and do a gig and it's quite soul destroying depending on, you know it might be the place is empty or whatever yeah. you might go and do the same exact type of gig yeah. and it can go down absolute blast so it's 100% based on the atmosphere the ambiance the the the, uh, the customers you know the punters um, they, they can make or break the gig now what I have learned uh, very quickly because was uh, as I was saying I'm, I'm more of a singer than a guitarist and, and um, uh, I, I bought a, I got an app called Jam Zone to learn to play songs right because I, I knew I needed to learn songs quickly to get my repertoire up and and I wanted to kind of try to get away from the the uh, rooms up I had I actually had a book with tabs in it you know like paper tabs when I first started and I wanted to get away from that I wanted to get you know um, looking a wee bit neater on stage and a wee bit more polished. So, so I, I've downloaded that app purely to learn the songs. Um, and so I was listening to it through headphones, playing and singing into a mic. And, uh, you know, I tried it at, at a gig one night. So I, I just played the acoustic covers for the first half of the gig. Yeah. And then I took a little break. And then for the second half of the gig, I took a line out of my pedal with the with the app with the backing tracks because the backing tracks are studio quality, um, uh, and uh, I, I took I ran that into my PA and I just played along with the backing tracks as if I was in my studio rehearsing. Yeah. And the place went mental. Yeah. 
<laughs> because you, you go for one guy on a guitar, which if you're really good and you can use the guitar like a percussion instrument almost, you know what I mean? Like I've seen really good guitarists that know how to use that guitar to make it sound more than one instrument. And then they can also say, I've not got that level of expertise, unfortunately. Yeah. So, um, to me, it was like, it was like a, it was a bit of a hack, really. It was like a fast track to hang on. Like, I could just, cause the vast majority of punters didn't care whether you know the stairway to having solo note for note. Like, they're out for the few drinks. They just want to hear somebody that can just about sound like something they recognize and they want to sing along with it. Eh? Um, <laughs> what you can get away with, but with confidence as well. Aye. And, and I found another thing was because I'd always really been in bands, I, I didn't like the solo thing. I don't know if that was how you felt when, like, when, when you started going out to it. I, I prefer being in bands. I like the camaraderie. I like the sound. I like the energy. Yeah. And I felt like when I started playing my backing tracks, it, it felt like I was in a band. There was nobody there, obviously. It was just my phone up and me. But, you know, that, the idea that there was... So that, for example, my fear is always making a, a proper howler in the middle of a song and having to stop, right? Mm-hmm. Now, usually... You can fudge your way through it, and people might notice, but they wouldn't say nothing really anyway. But, yeah. um, but as a performer, you just panic. That's the worst. I, like I'll forget, or I'll get to the chorus, I'll forget what the chords are, and I'll have to stop. And that has happened to me on my journey, and it is a bit embarrassing. Whereas with the backing tracks, if you forget the chord, you just stop playing for a bit. It goes, and then you remember, and then away you go. So it's like, I suppose it gave me, it gave me more confidence to perform. Another thing that that um, it dawned on me very quickly on when I started gigging because I had this kind of um, probably arrogant belief that um, because I remember speaking to Shawnee about it right Shawnee Sherman um, uh, or Shawnee Sherman Shawnee Aitchison but still Shawnee Sherman and um, I remember speaking to him at a party years ago I said that How's you getting on? How's he gigging and stuff? He's still busy. I said, ah, at that point, he was gigging quite a lot. And I said, oh, Katie's always at me to get out. And I'll, I'm, 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 I'm going to get out in the circuit. I'm, you know, I'll come to you for some advice. And we're chatting that night. And he's like, Yo, you're going to end up playing high ho silver lining and all that. And I said, no, no, no. What, what I'll do is I'll learn all the songs that I like. And I'll find the venues that want to put me on, right? Because I thought that's how it would work. And I quickly realised that that's not how it works. Actually, you have to kind of shed that ego a wee bit and realise that with the greatest will in the world, you're no there, really. It's important if you enjoy yourself, because that comes over in the energy in your performance, but you're no really there for you. You're no. really there to try and entertain that room full of people, and they'll, they'll have a whole range of ages and interests, and you know what I mean? And it's your job to try and find what works for them. It's like when people say, people say to me at gigs, um, play your favourite song. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, if I was going to play my favourite song, it'd be anything playing in here. Aye, aye, aye. I think, I think, I think it's it's funny because I just like I, I don't play the backing tracks. I, I've got like a, I, I, I use the stomp box. Aye. Right. Yeah. And I can't play a gig without it. Yeah. I feel really comfortable because you you can control the the tempo. I know it sounds. Yeah. You're playing the guitar, but no, I know what you mean. Adds that extra thing that 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 I hear it completely missing when it's mm-hmm. on the on the guitar. But I think it's that thing where people forget that you're basically just there to entertain the punters. And I think mm-hmm. sometimes get a wee bit precious, like, "Oh, I would never play with backing tracks," or "I would never." Mm-hmm. You're playing cover songs in a pub. It doesn't matter mm-hmm. what, what method you do. If you're yeah. comfortable doing that, as long as you're entertaining the partners that's what you're there to do and you're there to play all the songs that they want to hear and uh, it'll probably not be any of the songs that you would choose to listen to yourself but yeah that's your job uh, but obviously you, you do all the pubs do you write your own songs as well that it's um it's something that i'm passionate about um and i have been keeping the hand in with that and of course i started the central scotland song club Yes. which was lifted from, from club formats that I was going through to in King Tut's and, and in Glasgow run by Guy McCargan and uh, there's other guys that run it through there too and um, and I knew that Sterling needed something like that or, or could, sorry, that's a bit arrogant I felt Sterling could benefit from something like that so it's not just an open mic it was a wee bit more structured and organised and, and curated and that, that was solely to give people the platform to play their own songs because yeah. you can you can get at a reasonable level of ability you can get paid to play somebody else's songs all day long yeah. but very few places are 
are quite as keen to pay you to play your own material. And I feel if you are a, a, an artist or a musician or creative in any capacity, that that's as, that's an important part of it. Is to keep, you know what I mean? Is to keep that flame alive a wee bit because I think um, if that goes, if I wasn't doing that and I was just doing the cover cover stuff all the time, I think it would lose something for me. Eh? Like I think I think I think it would strip some of the essence of it away from me. I think it is a great wee opportunity as well because if you're if you're getting into you've maybe not performed live in front of people or you're maybe just starting to write, mm-hmm. films, you know you. D- you're not expected to go out and play an hour in front of people yeah. original yeah. songs. You get up and play one song, two yeah. songs, you know, and it's a great sort of little stepping stone to doing either your own, more of your own songs, mm-hmm. or covers in the pubs maybe later on, or joining a band, or just getting the, the feel for actually playing live and that. I've, st- I've still to come along to, to one of your ones. I've went along mm-hmm. to a couple of um, Scott Ashworth. Aye, Scott runs loads of uh, really good sessions as well, aye. They're great. I went along to a couple of Scots, and uh, I'll be honest, initially I was never interested in them. Mm-hmm. The, the reason being that because I was out all the time playing mm-hmm. in the pubs, the last thing I wanted to do was go and hear other people playing the same songs that I play. Mm-hmm. And um, But I went along one night, and it turned out, I was like, this is great, because I actually got to sit and talk to Scott. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The only time I see Scott is when Scott's packing up his gear and I'm setting up my gear. Aye. Yeah, it can be a bit like that, eh? Passing or that, and you actually get to sit and talk to some of the some of your sort of fellow musicians that you just never get a chance to do it. And then you might obviously discover, you know, somebody else, or if you want to start a band, that could be the place to go and all that sort of thing. So it is cool that you've started that. I know you do the one that's in Falkirk. Yeah, so there's one second um, Sunday or, or you depend on how many Sundays are in a month, obviously, but roughly the second, the middle of the month, Sunday is Falkirk, the end of the month is in, in Stirling. Um, so where and, is the yeah. one in Falkirk? What's the, the, the name? Uh, so, th- so that's called I- Icons uh, Sports Bar and Grill um, that, that we run that one in. What times is that on it? So they're typically they'll run between three and six, so it's kind of after the lunch time and then you know before the kind of evening session if you like. But it, you know they can be quite flexible in times. It's not a hard stop or finish. But uh, Slange uh, and, and Stirling. Yep, yeah, sl- Slange uh, and Stirling. So we've been there. We started obviously at King Cons, um, which was a great venue for it, um, and. Uh, you know, we just got the opportunity to move to a slightly bigger venue with outdoor space and, and a sort of permanent stage and PA and stuff too. So that yeah. that made a big difference for me because uh, when you're using your own gear, as you'll know, it's the, you know the carting back and forth and the kind of the damage that it does. You know what I mean? When you're uh, each time you're plugging it in and dis- and breaking it back down and things. So um, so I we moved that to Slange uh, just just um, September October last year. Um, but they've been great and and it's it's nice to see. I think I didn't expect it to get as popular as it's like regularly popular as it's been because it can be sometimes hard to expect people to regularly turn up to these things. But I think what's been really nice is that is exactly what you're saying, and it's the same what Scott does with his nights too. Obviously, he does his midweek, which is a bit harder for me to get to usually, but um, than the weekend ones. But it's to it's to create the community, not just the event, not just the not just the platform for people to learn and, and share their craft, but actually to connect, to, you know, form friendships, because it can be quite, so it's a bit of a cliche, but it can be quite lonely sometimes, especially if you're a solo gigging musician, because you're literally standing there, and depending on where you are or the audience, you, you, you know, sometimes you go in and you could be belting these tunes out and nobody's even really paying attention to you, you know what I mean? It can be that, a bit like so- that. Eh? That sounds like every gig that I play. <laughs> Uh, and you look and you think, gosh, like, was that that bad? And, and then all it takes as well, I don't know what it's like for you, but it, it just takes, I had this really funny experience in number two where, um, when I was, I think, was I using backing tracks for that point? Can't remember. I might have been, I might not, but, um, and you know that way where you're thinking nobody's listening to you. And, but you're, you know, you think, well, listen, uh, 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 just play your tunes, entertain people as best you can and yeah. they'll get too hung up on it. Don't, don't let the ego, uh, get too, too stressed. But there was a couple at the, far end of the bar 
And you know, you're kind of scanning the audience, and I thought they've never even paid a single bit of attention to anything I've played the whole night. And as they get up to leave, the guy puts twenty pound in my hand and said, "That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much." You know what I mean? And you're like, you just don't know sometimes. So even just because you're sat there and you don't think anyone's listening, just because they're no up engaging or dancing in front of you, it's, it doesn't mean to say you're not having an impact there. Eh? It does happen quite a lot. It's the amount of times I've, I've done gigs where it's maybe been quieter. So you've maybe only got 10, 15 people in the pub mm-hmm. and you play it and it doesn't matter what song you play. It can be from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. It doesn't matter. It just, you feel like nobody's, you, mm-hmm. you find a song, you get a couple of claps, nobody's really paying much attention and you're packing up at the end and almost every time mm-hmm. it comes up and they'll just say, listen, I just wanted to say that. I really enjoyed that. That was great. It makes all the difference, eh? Makes all the difference because it, it can. I, I've spoke with Shawnee a lot mm-hmm. of it as well. Like um, that, your confidence can get knocked, and, it, and it's weird because you would think the the more you play, or the longer that you've been. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if it's an age thing. It's like sometimes I'm just like, you know, I don't know, if, you know, if I'm if, if I'm doing, if I'm good at this or not. Mm-hmm. It just depends. I think where you're playing, but the, I think the problem that you've you've still had is I find is that. A lot of the pubs are still struggling from COVID. Mm-hmm. Certainly yeah, they are. Not as busy as it was uh, beforehand. I mean, you like to think as the weather gets better, more mm-hmm. more tourists, all that sort of thing. But it's still different from the way it was before COVID. It's not properly recovered. Right. I mean, so obviously, I've, I've, I've not got any real world experience of what it was like prior, other than going in and seeing acts. Yeah. But I'll, I'll, I'll defer to your knowledge. But I do... I have sensed that things have been a bit different and obviously you, you just look at the number of pubs that are closing on a weekly and monthly basis across the UK at the moment so you can clearly see they're not getting the same footfall in certain areas um, and and I understand. And of course like you, you know us as musicians um, might be quite a big expense for a venue depending on how many people are in um, too you're, so you're talking about number two Baker Street now yeah myself and Liam Played on a Thursday night in there for about seven or eight years. Mm-hmm. Prior to that, it was um, Drifting Ebers mm-hmm. across the road. Albeit that was probably more Liam. I'd, I'd get up and do a few songs. Mm. But right. Baker Street was the two of us playing. And I mean, the place would close at 12 o'clock. And it was like a, fri- it was like a Friday, Saturday night. You couldn't get moving at this mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That busy, but it was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Mm-hmm. Every night it was absolutely. Mm-hmm. I can mm-hmm. like if you go into Stirling now, Fridays and Saturdays will be busy. Yeah, um, it can be a hit or a miss. Um, but there's more places opening up, trying live music as well. I, I'm just going to say that I think what's happened a wee bit in Stirling is um, there was a few places. I think Molly's and Number Two were the two. Uh, they, they, they were the kind of the, the two legacy certainly in the last decade let's say right they, they were probably the two main places you would always go somebody says where's live music on that would be the two that would come yeah. to mind and then you've obviously had venues like King Cons that wanted to put music at the heart of it which was great and, and I know Nicky and our team worked really hard to, to make that music pub then you've got Slange that came along and, and sort of did the same then you had um City Walls uh, put, putting on bands and then you had Corn Exchange putting on bands so um, it's been great because it's given loads of musicians, not just from Stirling but the surrounding areas, a platform Fubar's doing something on the Thursday nights as well so it's great to see that but Stirling is quite a small town there is a finite audience mm-hmm. and maybe some places have been eating other places lunches I don't know, I don't think that's been the intention of course but I think that's maybe what's happened a bit you know So Barry, we're obviously still in the first half of 2024. Mm-hmm. What, what's your plans for the rest of the year with regard to music? Uh, that's a really good question. So I'd had, um, I, I, I'm desperate to find the time, and I, this year I've got the time really at the minute, so I'm desperate to find the time to finish, and I think an album would be a big ask, but an EP four or five songs yep. that um, that would act as um, 
uh, a catalogue in the last few years. I've had a lot going on in my world the last as is everybody COVID and whatnot and personal situations and things and um uh, I, I can find I find music can be quite therapeutic to to uh, you know some people like to journal and diary and whatever else I like to to, to get these moments done and on a song, because when I look back on it in 10, 15, 20 years' time, it will remind me like a photograph of, of you know, particular situations and, and snapshots in my life. So um, I would love to think I could, um, for this chapter, this this part of my story, get something down. Um, but it has been a bit challenging. And because now I'm gigging regularly uh, and I'm a paid musician now, a professional musician, dare I say it, um, although it still doesn't, it feels weird for me to say that because... It still feels like a hobby, really, and I'm not sure I'd ever want it not to be a hobby as well. I, I'm kind of, and I don't know where I sit on that, but um, because I'm now gigging, so I'm working during the day, um, you know, daddy duties during the, the the evenings with with the kids, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, most weekends, I'm I'm now actually gigging. So it's it's about allowing myself the time, the creative time, to finish off that, um, and. Yeah, that would be my big hope for this year. I was supposed to be at a songwriting camp, which I went last year with uh, Kyle Faulkner and uh, La, La Sierra Casa, it's called. It's in the foothills of uh, uh, Spanish mountains, just outside Alicante, and it's a great experience. Spend a week, drink your own body weight and beer, uh, but you spend time with other musicians at various ages and stages, but you've got professional co-writers there with you, like say Kyle and Bo Blaze. And I was supposed to go in the camp last week, but because of personal reasons, I had to call off. So I was a bit gutted about missing that. So you're thinking about doing an EP? Mm-hmm. W- would that be just yourself and a guitar, or do you play other instruments, or would you get other guys to to, to record as a band? How, how would you do that? I, I would want... I, I, the actual idea that's came to me in the last week or two... Um, uh, which um, I, I actually have been really quite motivated by, but again, I need to try and find the time, or maybe just find a group of people motivated with the same project. Was um, uh, was to do like an EP or like a um, maybe even a single um, with a B side or two um, for mental health support, you know, to support mental health charities, particularly, um, uh, m- m- you know, for for men at the moment. I think there's um, I've had loads of conversations with different friends and stuff, and I think um, I think it's a big, big issue, you know, um, and it's, a, it's an issue that's close to my heart. So it would be great to think that we could we could co-write. I know I think you, you mentioned Barry Frame. I'm sure he did something really cool with the Strathcarn Hospice sort of charity single um, mm-hmm. a couple of years ago as well. So something along those lines, um, but maybe for mental health. Um, local mental health charities because they're, they're quite underfunded and under-resourced and um, it would be good to see if we could turn some of our talents to, to a project like that. And see the songs that, that, that have you got any songs that, you would, that you've got at the moment that you would like to develop and maybe finish? Um, I, I've got I've got loads of different loads of I don't know how your what your songwriting process is like, but I've got loads of these scraps of paper and voice notes and stuff, you know. So there's always a seedling to draw on. But um, I'd really love because I had that experience in the La Sierra Casa last year. I'd never really done that apart from being in bands. And when you're in bands, you get used to how each other writes. Yeah. Whereas to kind of be dropped into an environment where you didn't know somebody who's talented but has a different view, it's it's slightly discomforting, but actually quite exhilarating at the same time. So I'd actually like to sit and co-write with somebody that I've never written before and see if we could come up with something um, and, and maybe write several songs with different um, with different people um, or, or even as a you know as a group as a wee kind of mini super group type thing. But I think that'd be a great exercise. Wait, wait, we'll wait and see. But I'll, I'll, I'll be expecting by Christmas that you've mm-hmm. got an EP ready for everyone to purchase. That that but well, now that you've put it out there, uh, <laughs> that could be that gives us plenty of time. I think. Yeah, I, I reckon we could write it and record it um, by then. I think. One song a month. There you go. No pressure. Aye. <laughs> so, before, we finish, before we finish things, Barry, I've got some fun because mm-hmm. we've been quite okay. at this point, right? So, imagine you could hop back in time. Mm-hmm. What's the one gig anywhere in the world? What's the one gig or concert that you wish? you could have attended and witnessed? Oh, I mean, the, um, 
I suppose the kind of natural cliche answer would be Woodstock, wouldn't it? Like, because uh, that must have been some uh, some event. Well, do you want, um, what the, the 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 main answer that I've had is actually been live aid. Oh, aye, that'd have been aye, that'd have been quite a cool live but, experience, definitely. But Woodstock would have been a cool one. Isle of Wight, you know. The, the other one I had a quick, um, uh, Nirvana at uh, Redden, and le- the footage of that looks awesome. You know where he comes on in the field chair and uh, and like that. That would have been because I had a ticket to see Nirvana at the SCCC on the tour that he was on, but it, they, they, he had that mental breakdown in Germany and I had to go back to the US, and that's when he committed suicide. So I never I actually think, got to see him. I think see anything by Pearl Jam across mm. two albums. Yeah. Like, see, like, 91 to 93. Yeah. They were just a force to be reckoned with. They, 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 are, they are, and I've seen them about four or five times, so I, I've been lucky that I've, I've exercised that ghost for them. But aye, those, those early, you know, when Eddie used to climb up in the in yeah. the, the, the rigs, like, when they had that sort of energy, there's so much it was spilling out of them. Yeah. They had, obviously, Dave Abruzzi on drums. That's right, aye, aye, aye. Oh, that, 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 Right, so you're thinking Woodstock, right? Yeah. Along the sort of same vein, then um, there's millions of great songs that have been recreated, recorded across the years. Yeah. What's the one song that you wish you could have been sat in the recording studio at the recording desk to witness it being recorded? Wow. Jeez, oh, how do you narrow that one down? Um... Uh, the, way I think, I put it, the way I put it, you've got songs like, for example, Bohemian Rhapsody, right? Now, there's no mm-hmm. de- a great, unique so- song. Mm-hmm. Probably wouldn't have been that interest as interesting to watch it in the studio because it was built, mm-hmm. you know. I think, see, personally, see something like The Doors, mm-hmm. like recording early women, and everybody's just mic'd up in the recording studio and they hit mm-hmm. the the play and it's the band playing live in the studio. Something to me, I just think that would have been a out. No, win. I I agree. I mean, I I think there's there's something drawing me to like Led Zeppelin or something. I, 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 you know, there, there's something quite um, energetically really cool about those guys at, at their height. It would have been really interesting to see, the, you know, those creative forces how they played off each other and fed off each other and how. <laughs> How if they got into a studio with an idea, how that then became the song? Because they, they seem to be so creative that I think what they go in with and what it becomes are two different things. You know what I mean? So that, I think that uh, Led Le Zeppelin might have been quite cool to see. But there's too many. There's too many to pick one. Actually, that that I'll need. To, I'll need to come back to you with. What about if you could um, dead or alive? If you could have two or three musicians that that you could walk yourself away in a studio for a month and you could write two or three songs. Who would who would you would like to? I mean, there's no saying that it would work. No. But who's two or three of the musicians that you would, you just think it'd be cool to sit down and bounce some ideas off them? Uh, uh, well, Jimi Hendrix has got to be the first one, right? Because I think he would have been phenomenal to just sit and and watch. Um, I just watched the documentary, but you mentioned the earlier as well. Uh, uh, the Doors, uh, Jim Morrison. These last few days and stuff, you know, and I know he's a troubled soul, but um, I think he'd be a really, really cool guy to um, to to I to rough off, um, and it, it, it'd need to be John Lennon as well, wouldn't it? I mean, God, uh, to, to to spend any time in his energy and and his uh, ability would be would be an absolute blessing. Thank you. Um, he'd maybe just go on a night out with him. <laughs> A very good chance. He would just be there for. Uh, he would be there for um, uh, to watch what happened. But um, I mean, even like, even, gosh, even guys like Elvis, not too. Imagine being in a room with Elvis, you know, and um, and seeing how he crafted and, and used his talent. And, uh, yeah, and, and the other thing as well that strikes me, particularly about these en- enigmatic sort of frontmen, is how troubled really they all were, and 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 you know, and how um, and how much. That turbulence maybe fed the creativity, or did the creativity feed the turbulence? Who knows, eh? But it's uh, it's, it's funny because easy. with the doors, I remember watching a documentary. And it was the guitarist Robbie Krieger talking, and mm-hmm. he, it used to annoy him so much. You know, you know, Jim Morrison he, when he was of 
you know, if he was mm -hmm. at any point, you know, he could write some amazing stuff and, yeah. and great ideas. And he's like, you know, why can he not? Why can he not be like that and be the great front man? Mm -hmm. Why? But why has he got to have this drunken part and mm -hmm. self destruction and that? But he's saying, you know, he would see other singers and and they have it, and but they don't have any of the bad stuff. And he's saying, but mm -hmm. he just realised over time, some people it just comes hand in hand that the mm -hmm. really the creativity and self destruction all all rolls into one sort of package for for it some. It can be, it can be, yeah. Um, but he gets, yeah. He gets jealous though because he sees like the stones. Mm -hmm. He's thinking to himself, you know, 50 years later, they're still up there and they're, they're not doing it for the money. They're doing it because they, they love no. being live and he gets jealous because he's like, you know, they could have had... It could have been them. Aye, and, and the, there's a case for that. The Doors were a pretty impressive band, but um, there was there was a lot going on, I think, with Jim. But, um, and and uh, uh, you look at how Mick has kept himself... I mean, it, I, I saw him, must have been about 10 years ago now, at uh, Hamden. Katie and I got tickets to go and see him. And I was blown away by how much he had. And he was in his 70s at that point. I'm thinking, God, he would put so many young front men to shame the sheer energy that he's got. You know what I mean? Uh, at that age. So the guys, he's, he's a special case, though, I think, isn't he? Yeah, I was a wee bit like that. With AC, I saw ACDC in the Black Ice Tour. Yeah. Much as I wanted to see them, personally, I thought they were at least 15 years, 20 years past their prime. Right. But it proved me completely wrong. And yeah. I mean, those guys were, were probably in their 60s at the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, two and a half hours, and it was just non-stop. It was just outstanding. Aye. Aye. Yeah, I saw uh, Bruce Springsteen. I saw him uh, uh, last year as well. And uh, I, I saw a few people saying they didn't think he was that great. I, I thought it was, you know, given his age and his 70s, I have to view it through the prism of where the guy is. I thought he was really good as well, you know. So. Would you know, like, to have sat down with maybe a young Eddie Vedder? See what you come up with. I, I, I mean, he's he was my he <laughs> was. Ironically, right? Um, I don't know what it's like for you, but um, I didn't play any Pearl Jam covers at, at, at the, in the pub gigs. I mean, I know that's it's an acquired taste as a band anyway, but I didn't play because he was so overbearingly influential in my teenage years that I just didn't feel that I could do it justice. You know what it's like. You play all the normal crowd pleasers. Mm -hmm. If it's a quiet night, or if it's a type of gig where you, the crowd where you can just throw in a couple of wee sort of curveballs, mm -hmm. I've seen myself once or twice. You know, I'll, I'll do like a Metallica song, yeah, and uh, or I've done an Iron Maiden song once. Brilliant. Um, done a Pearl, done Pearl Jam a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, Soundgarden once, but it's got to. It's really just at the gigs where it's super quiet that nobody's yeah. that you can squeeze one in. But it's that thing where there's only so much you can do when you've got just you and a guitar. Yeah, you totally, know, those totally. are meant to be played with a band. Yeah, I to do it justice. I. Yeah. And, but, and, no, you're right, Eddie Vedder, certainly a young Eddie Vedder um, would be an interesting. Or, or an old Eddie Vedder, I'd like to sit with him the new and just kind of you know to the. To the fat them. And last question for you: Who's your um, who's your Mount Rushmore for bands? So who's the four bands or musicians for yourself you see as perfection? Wow, these are really good questions. Um, well, I mean, as it would be Pearl Jam or you know or Eddie. I mean, Eddie would be the figurehead, but I respect in equal measure all the guys and the contribution they've made to the band, you know, Jeff and Stone and yeah. Mike, um, they've all, how they've kept together and changed the sound and whatever else. Um, but yeah, the, Eddie would need to be there. Um, uh, I think cause, because I've mentioned them and it is, it is a wee bit cliched, but it is worth, it's definitely worth, um, they, they would deserve a place in anybody's Mount Rushmore, but it would need to be, who would you pick, Lennon or McCartney, or both of them? Uh, I guess would need to would need to be there because the, the, their music has been so, and it's certainly of our generation, it's been so influential. You know what I mean? I, I uh, they're probably, arguably, the most important band um, because I reckon most. I mean, you're always going to have music, but the influence that they had. And still have. And still continue to have, yeah. I think that's the difference. 
ridiculous. I mean, there's millions of great bands out there, but you ask any bands from the 70s, 80s, 90s, yeah. every one of them's influenced by the Beatles. 100%. And I think um, it's... I think what the Beatles did, I mean, it was the whole kind of Beatles versus Stones. Eh? Stones, to me, sort of epitomised rock and roll, right? They, they were they were rock and roll. They they kind of set the tone for all the, the indie bands and all that that's followed since there eh, has kind of been based on that archetype. But the Beatles, I don't think the Beatles have ever really been replicated again, like because they 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 were they were so chameleon. You you know what I mean? Like if you listen to all their albums and how diverse their sound was and I remember when, when I went to the, the songwriting camp and with Kyle Kyle Faulkner um at that first one and we were just sitting having a beer and stuff talking about, you know, how how you get inspiration and he says if anybody asks me how to become a songwriter, I tell them, listen to the Beatles discography from start to finish. Yeah. Just listen to the whole lot. And and work out the chords and work out the structures and watch what they're doing and and because every single songwriting technique and ability and trope and you know and as uh, as in there in some capacity and they broke new ground and they moved. They, they also they created sounds that had never been heard before. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Stones as much as they were good were a blues band that kind of just mm-hmm. put, put their own spin on it. Aye. But the, the Beatles were doing things that had never been done before. They were trying things that had never been done. That's why I think that's why I view them the way I do. Yeah, and I don't think anybody's been as successful as they've been to 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 change as much as that. A lot of bands they'll, they'll maybe try a really bold move and try and change, but their fans or the general public get a bit, you know, they push back on it. But the Beatles had that ability to radically shift the sound and take their audience with them. In fact, maybe even grow their audience, you know. Yeah. So you've got the Beatles. So the Beatles, uh, I'd have Pearl Jam. Uh, I'd, I'd stick in Richard Ashcroft as well, you know. Right. Because vocally, I know he's maybe no up on the same level, legend, uh, legendary status, but um, there's something about that guy's vocal that... You know, when you hear him live and stuff as well, as I've been lucky enough to do, um, it can cut through you, man. He's he's, he's some chanter, that, that guy. Eh? Yeah. Um, and since we mentioned him earlier, and he would deserve to be on it, largely because I wouldn't sit and listen to a lot of his albums or his songs, but um, he's, he's the king for a reason, man. Eh? I think Elvis Presley, when you see the impact that he had in those really early days, you know, when, 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 when rock music was kind of forming, um, such a cool guy as well. I know he had these issues and all, but when you see him in his prime, you were building to... up there. I thought you were going to say Martin Malady, but he would have been number. Well, I, I, Martin, if you were looking for I, guys that I would be able to um, I, to, to play alongside and be privileged to Martin Malady, I better tell my I, we better say Martin. Can you cut and put Martin back into that bit, and we'll just drop out Richard Ashcroft maybe. <laughs> <laughs> right, Barry, thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Ian. You at long last. And thank you, thank you so obviously much. Obviously, me making a noise in the pub, come up and say hello as well. But I'm going to try and get Definitely. myself along to one of the the song clubs as well because I'm I'm only in Larbert, so. Oh, yeah. perfect! I know that would be great. I mean, are you are you doing much of your own your own stuff as well? You writing, keeping a hand in there. Funny you say that. Um, I I do so I, I write stuff all the time, mm-hmm. but especially last year. I think last year I've done seventy five gigs. Mm-hmm. Some people's not a lot, yeah. But, you know, it was a lot for me, and it was playing cover songs, mm-hmm. and uh, it was a good money maker. But I was getting a bit bored with it. I'm still doing them, but uh, mm-hmm. really, there's something missing. And a few things happened last year, and I thought to myself, you know what? I, thought, I in the back of my mind, I thought, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll try starting a band again. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm writing songs, and, and I can picture it in my head. Right, this would be the opener. If I was playing, yeah. this would be the good, the one to finish on. You know, yeah. it all saying, I was like, these songs I'm writing are, are, are good, but they need to play with a band. And mm-hmm. I went and seen Shawnee. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Aye. And uh, I've been talking on the podcast, mm-hmm. and I'm hearing people talking about songwriting, writing their own songs, doing this, doing that. Uh, and then I went and seen Shawnee, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to stop just sitting about thinking about this. So I put an app and uh, tomorrow, oh no, sorry, this is Monday, Wednesday this week, I've actually got the first jam session with a drummer. Brilliant. Uh, who contacted me, who who had sent him on songs I've been writing. And yeah. 
liking the sound of them. So I don't know what it'll be like. We need, we need to obviously meet up and mm-hmm. be jam session. I've got a bass player. He can't, he can't make it now, but he does all mm-hmm. the, on on the recordings. Um, so we're going to meet up and have a wee jam, and, and I'll just no expectations. We'll just see mm-hmm. what what happens with it. But that's all original stuff. Yeah, yeah, good. That's good. I'm kind of hoping that I feel like there's been something missing, and I, I think yeah. it, that's what I'm missing. Is um, yeah. you know, it's all fine writing and recording songs, but there's something different about playing them in front of people. No, there is, there is, and it's um, and and it's a kind of validation, I suppose, isn't it? You you know, you, you get feedback pretty quickly on whether you've written a good tune uh, uh, to, in, in front of an audience as well. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that if you didn't get feedback right away, it's a bad tune, because how many bands have you seen? You know, there's a picture recently, a meme doing the rounds on Facebook, and it's um, Tyler Childs, you know, the, the kind of American um, singer, and he's sat in this kind of bistro thing, and n- nobody's paying attention to him. This is just like a few years ago, really. Yeah. And um, uh, it's, it's amazing how quickly these things can change. Well, that's great. I'm glad that you're so well. You're, wel- you're welcome to come along to the song club and... Uh, and uh, and try it out with, if we try a few of them out if, even if you can get them up to a, a but it's um, funny you say that because I've been practising them because obviously I've wrote them recorded them but I've not really done anything with them since so I'm not yep. used to play, actually playing them so with the practice coming up I've been starting mm-hmm. to play them but because I've been doing so many gigs I've, I've not got any issues with you know it only takes me two or three run through and yep. pretty much it, it's mm-hmm. not too bad but um, they're the type of songs that, you know, some of them you, you could just do it on an acoustic, you, you wouldn't yeah. do the whole band. Other ones it would probably sound good, but I think I missed the band thing. See, having the drums, yeah. you thumping yeah. away, driving the whole song, and you're just sort of playing there, at, you know. So we'll see what happens, but it's purely for a bit of fun. But I, I'm looking forward to it because I've, I've not played in a band for, you know, over 10 years now. Right, Easy. okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. So it'll be it'll be interesting, but I'll What's keep. What's the space? Have you got a name a name yet? Oh, the the, ba- the band's called Stillway. Right, perfect. So I've, I've already released three EPs. Right, okay, oh brilliant, okay. So the last couple of years, I, I recorded three different EPs, and there's a fourth one getting made. But uh, mm. it's all great, but it just feels like there's something missing, and I think it's yeah. that it'd be great to hear these songs played with a band. Yeah. Uh, just have a final piece of the jigsaw I think it's that thing I'm thinking now as you, as you get a wee bit older you're like mm-hmm. you know what time flies by so quickly if I don't do it now would I regret it in 10 years yeah. time I should have just done that and so yeah. that's what I'm thinking so we'll see what happens at this between that the podcast the cover gigs working through mm-hmm. like yourself I'm running out of days and then mm-hmm. actually squeeze everything in but they're all, they're, they're all enjoyable and worthwhile endeavours, aren't they? So, but ho- hopefully you'll get uh, you'll get a few live uh, a few live sessions under your belt as well. That'll be great. I'll keep you in mind once I become famous and I'm needing support. <laughs> <laughs> Give me plenty of time, mate. I'll need quite right. a lot of time to memorise. It was lovely to, uh, to speak to you, though. I uh, thank you for coming on, and I'll get myself along to one of uh, the Central Scotland song clubs, and I'll uh, cheer you on. I might even get up and uh, make some racket as well. That sounds like a plan. Thanks so much, Ian. Cheers, pal. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.